Hello music lovers, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for dropping by this video. And in this one, I'm going to be revisiting a topic I talked about a couple of years back. You know, what the hell happened to hard rock and heavy metal in the 80s and 90s? You know, in this video, I'm gonna be asking some pretty serious questions and getting some answers too, like, did Beavis and Butthead really cause the decline of 80s hair band Winger? Did Ozzy Osbourne actually have a hard time pouring that glass of orange juice in the decline of Western Civilization Part 2? Which frontman from an 80s hair band went country for a while in the 90s? And are Quiet Riot, Warrant, and Twisted Sister truly heavy metal bands? Stay tuned for more highlights, extra teasing, and hair metal analysis that is sure to be nothing but a good time for all coming right up. Well, two years ago, I made this video called Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow. Maybe you checked it out. It was about my experience as a teenager growing up in the 80s and then, uh, you know, being in my 20s and the 90s when all these hair bands and the grunge movement came and went. It was about the, uh, you know, the innovators and the imitators and the imposters that came and basically built the scene and then crashed it eventually and my thoughts on that. And, uh, you know, I noticed that this video has been getting a lot of action lately. Even though it's been a couple of years, it's been amongst uh, my top 10 most uh, watched videos as of late. So I figured, you know what, this is a topic that you guys obviously like. Maybe I can do a follow-up. So I figured I would uh, read some of your comments from that video, and uh, that would lead to a whole discussion about a lot of things, uh, 80s hair metal, or whatever you want to call it. So let's get into the first comment here from John. He asks, in your opinion, did Beavis and Butthead cause the decline line of Winger. Well, John, thanks for the comment. You know, I think Winger's days were numbered anyway. I mean, look, uh, you know, Beavis and Butthead were a cartoon on MTV, came out around 1992, and they used to make fun of music videos. And of course, you know, Beavis and Butthead, they prominently wore t-shirts by ACDC and Metallica. And they had this friend named Stuart, who uh, was kind of like this mama's boy, and they used to make fun of him. He had on a Winger shirt. And so the thing is that, you know, Winger, you know, was always being made fun of by MTV, and it helped to collapse their career, you know? So it reminds me of that comedian Jeff Foxworthy and his whole routine, you know? If you've ever cracked open a beer at your grandfather's eulogy, you might be a redneck, you know? If you ever bought cigarettes with a credit card, you might be a redneck. So it's like if an MTV cartoon crashes your career, then maybe you sucked to begin with. And I know a lot of people aren't gonna like that. So I've heard a lot of people talk about Winger and say, hey, they're a great band. They play really, really well. And this was never about these bands, these hair bands, uh, not being able to perform well or not saying that they're not good players in their own right. You wouldn't get to that stage being signed by major record labels if you couldn't play. It was never about that. It was about hanging their image on MTV, on fads, on, you know, what kind of hairspray you were using and, you know, what kind of clothes that you were wearing. It was all about image. So when the whole image came and went, so did your band, if you didn't have a lot of substance behind it. And, uh, you know, Winger pretty much hung their career on MTV. I mean, their first album went nowhere for six months. Uh, they almost got dropped by their label, and then they were able to get a couple of these videos on MTV, and then, uh, you know, their career blew up. They became really, really popular. But yeah, Beavis and Butthead making fun of them in 92 did not help things, although I don't think that was the only reason. I mean, maybe it was because, you know, just what they were doing was going out of style, the whole hairband stuff. Plus, maybe Kip Winger being a ballerina, that might have had something to do with it too. I don't know. Let me know what you think. All right, here's Winnie making a comment about the thumbnail that I used for my video two years ago. The thumbnail is Nitro. That band is the epitome of all problems in hair metal. Actually, I didn't know that Nitro was the band featured in that thumbnail, uh, but yeah, I do agree. They look like the epitome of what I was going for in that particular video. And then, uh, yeah, Nitro is a band that came along in the late 80s. They were the epitome of the whole hair metal scene. You know, they, of course, had the big hair, and the lead singer had, you know, sky-high vocals. The guitarist had this ridiculous, like, quad-neck guitar. He would probably have one neck shooting out of his ass if he probably could. It was just amazing. 
Now, Nitro actually changed their look in the 90s, you know, with the whole Seattle scene coming in. Uh, they let their hair down, no more hairspray, had a more grungy look about them. Now, when the band finally imploded, uh, the former lead singer Jim Gillette went on to become a seven-time jiu-jitsu champion, and uh, he had a whole lot of other drama happening in his life. And that brings us to another episode, I should say a drama-filled episode of These Are the Bad Hair Days of Our Lives, a dope opera. You see, Jim got married to Lita in the mid-90s after knowing her for only two weeks. Now, Lita never really loved Jim and thought he was a total control freak. And she would have left him, but she was carrying their baby and so decided to stay with him longer. Now, years later, they divorced after a reality TV show about their lives went south and Jim turned her own children against her. Now, years earlier, Lita was also married to Chris Holmes, formerly of Wasp. He's best known for the infamous scene in the 1988 film, The Decline of a Western Civilization Part Two, where a 29-year-old Chris is sloppy drunk floating around in a swimming pool in front of his mother when he pours Smirnoff vodka all over his face before sliding off into the water. Or was it really vodka at all? Hmm. Well, Lita Ford says it was all staged. She says that scene really ticked me off because that was a setup. Penelope Spheris, who was the producer of the film, set Chris up for that scene, which I thought was just dirty. And he ended up pouring pool water all over his face. It's not vodka in that bottle. Can you imagine pouring vodka all over your face like that? It was a setup, and it really ruined his career. It just destroyed his career, which is why he doesn't live in this country anymore. Yeah, actually, the director for that movie, Penelope Spheris, she admitted to faking that scene with Chris Holmes in the swimming pool. And also, she admitted to another scene that she faked, too, with Ozzy Osbourne in the kitchen making breakfast. Uh, he was talking about how he was, you know, fucked up on drugs and alcohol during the 70s, and now he's trying to get his life cleaned up. And uh, as he was pouring orange juice, he completely missed the glass to make it look like he was really fucked up. And uh, the truth is, is that that was just a joke. That wasn't even Ozzy's kitchen. So yes, thanks so much for tuning in to another high drama episode of these bad hair days of our lives. Yeah, actually, be sure to check out the companion playlist to this video. I'll link it in the description below and also up above. I'll include the uh, Decline of Western Civilization Part 2 documentary along with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that documentary, a great look at the Sunset Strip, uh, the whole music scene for the hair metal bands and everything, 1987, 1988. Be sure to check that out. Now, there was this other documentary about the hair band scene from the 80s, uh, put out by MTV in the mid-90s, and it was called, It Came From The 80s Part 2, Metal Goes Pop, where they uh, followed up on a lot of these 80s hair metal bands to see what they were doing a few years later when that whole scene died out. They showed, you know, Brett Michaels of Poison when that band collapsed, how he, uh, you know, wanted to become an actor and a director, and also, like, Brian Forsyth of uh, Kicks. He uh, went on to paint billboards. And also, does anyone remember the 80s hair band Keel? I didn't think so, but uh, lead singer Ron Keel, he went country for a while in the 90s. Anyone remember his classic hit, My Horse is a Harley? Yeah, well, uh, the only thing that this song makes me want to do is keel over. Now, George Lynch of the band Dokken, he uh, talked also about what happened to his band and why they went away uh, after the 80s hair band thing ended. And here's what he had to say. He said, we weren't setting trends. We were following them. Subscribing to the lifestyle was our biggest mistake. I was compelled to create this false image that had to conform to the fans' expectations. But I think musically, we were more viable than some of the other bands. And then we had leader of the band Don Dockin weigh in on this topic too, and he said this. He said, we became parodies of ourselves. Big hair, lots of makeup. Dockin failed miserably at being a hair band. We tried to tear our t-shirts. I tried to put the blue mascara on. We just couldn't get it together. In hindsight, I think we should have listened to our managers a little more. Our managers went on to manage people like Metallica. They always told us, just be yourself. You don't have to follow the trends in Hollywood. Wear jeans. I said, you don't understand. This is what's happening. We need the big hair. You don't understand. You're just a manager. And then 10 years later, I'm a little embarrassed. 
And the documentary also hooked up with Lita Ford, who by the mid-90s, as I mentioned, was uh, all wrapped up in the uh, bad hair days of her life with Jim Gillette. And I remember she was sitting on the beach and she was just kind of waiting and wondering if uh, you know, rock was ever going to make a return. Would anybody ever care about hair metal again? And I remember wondering myself if that was ever going to happen. You know, We were at the height of the whole grunge thing in the mid-90s, and uh, it was kind of hard to see you know, hair metal ever coming back, but what have we found to be true? You know, all these bands are back out there again. Lita Ford's back on tour, you know, Poison. They were just about to go on the, probably the biggest tour of their lives playing stadiums along with Motley Crue. This was their biggest tour ever. They'd never played stadiums before. You know, Motley Crue probably more popular now than ever. A lot of these hair metal bands that were done by the end of the 80s or the early 90s are suddenly back out there now. So what the hell happened? It's not like hair metal is topping the charts. And this gets down to a whole generational thing that you just don't have the luxury of seeing at the time. So, you know, it's like these kids from the 80s, they eventually had their own kids and they played Poison and Lita Ford and Motley Crue and all these bands that they grew up on and loved. And so their kids now, you know, 15, 20 year old, maybe 30 year old, and they've never seen these bands that their parents grew them up on. And so there's this appetite uh, to want to, you know, go out and see these bands now that we didn't have back in the 90s and unfortunately it's not something that you can never see coming but uh, now we should all know and realize that whatever comes around goes around now here's a comment this was a good perspective about the history but your bias is evident and tainted the video a bit uh, yes, this is my channel, it's my commentary, I'm very biased, and uh, quite frankly, that's the only way that this could ever work. And uh, so, but I do thank you for your comment, thank you very much. All right, here's another comment from Kyler. He says, it's also really interesting to see how a lot of the more legitimate metal bands in the 80s also adopted a more gritty and heavier sound going into the 90s. It was like everyone just got really depressed for a while. Yeah, Kyler, thanks for that comment. It reminds me of what happened to Metallica, you know, between the 80s and the 90s. I mean, here's a band that was a thrash speed metal band in the 80s, and, you know, they totally avoided the whole hair metal thing. Uh, and then when they moved into the 90s, between Injustice for All and the Black Album, I mean, they made a complete change, uh, almost like a different band. I mean, you listen to Enter Sandman and Sad But True and Nothing Else Matters, very, very different than the whole thrash progressive metal thing that they were doing back in the 80s. It kind of reminds me of what happened to Rush between hemispheres and permanent waves, you know, getting rid of the longer songs and uh, moving to a more streamlined uh, approach. It was like you can hear and I know that there's people that don't like the Metallica phase where they went to the Black Album and all that, but you can definitely hear their growth in the songwriting department. They were learning songcraft and how to use melodies and to write, you know, five, six minute songs and, uh, you know, say what you want about it, but they definitely did a lot of growing in that period. And if they were more like a jackhammer during the 80s, they were more like a sledgehammer in the 90s. Still very, very heavy, but definitely more, you know, they weren't speeding. It was more starker, heavier, aggressive sounds coming out. And then, of course, after that, they took it a step further with the whole Load album, which uh, started to really get away from, uh, I, I, you know, I really started to like them less after that period just because they started getting into more like alternative territory. Uh, if you take a look at the video for Until It Sleeps, it was the same guy that was making videos for the Smashing Pumpkins and the Cranberries. And uh, I would wonder, you know, if Cliff Burton, the original bass player for Metallica, who unfortunately uh, was killed uh, in a bus accident after the Master of Puppets album, uh, you know, if he was still around, would he have gone for the whole, you know, cutting your hair and the whole load album stuff? Would he have, you know, been on board for all that? And uh, James Hetfield addressed that in this interview, and here's what he had to say. He said, I would certainly think that load and reload, I would have had an ally in Cliff Burton that was very against it all. The reinvention or the U2 version of Metallica. My opinion is that all of the imagery and stuff like that was not necessary. And the amount of songs that were written was, it diluted the potency of the poison of Metallica. And I think Cliff would have agreed with that. 
So yeah, James is referring to, you know, back in the Master of Puppets, Ride the Lightning days, they had like, you know, eight songs on an album. And then by the time we get to like load and reload, there's like 13, 14 songs on an album. Of course, they're shorter. And James just kind of felt like the band lost their potency during this period. Let me know what you think about Metallica, 80s versus 90s. All right, be sure to drop it below. And, you know, speaking of Rush, now there's a band that really benefited from the aggression of the 90s. Uh, this is when Rush got their balls back. You know what I mean? You know, during the 70s, they were a hard rockin' band. They inspired a lot of metal bands that would come later. Uh, during the 80s, they went through a keyboard phase. By the early 90s, with Presto and Roll the Bones, starting to get their power trio uh, roots back. But uh, with 1994's Counterparts album, that's where they really reconnected with the uh, true guts of Rush. Very heavy album, and I uh, really did like a lot of stuff on this album. Actually, the video for Stick It Out was done by the same guy that did Until It Sleeps. Uh, really just a dark and depressing <laughs> looking video. But I remember when Stick It Out first came out, when I first heard that, I was like, holy shit, Rush are back. And uh, they stayed heavy until the end. All right, well, now let's take a little time out and pour some trivia on me, all right? Let's see if you guys can figure this one out. Which singer from an 80s hairband said this? about their competition. There's no competition. If there's any competition for us, it's the supergroups like Led Zeppelin or the Rolling Stones. All right, was this A, Brett Michaels of Poison, B, Stephen Piercy of Rat, or was it C, Tom Kiefer of Cinderella? The answer is B, Stephen Piercy of Rat. That's right, yes, uh, somewhere in an alternate universe out there, the mighty Led Zeppelin and the legendary Rolling Stones have a bit of a rat problem. That's right, a uh, rival so way cool that their very legacies may be headed for the cellar. I don't know. Here's another comment from Yardley. Yardley, love your insight. Glad you weren't too hard on the crew. Long live crew, timeless. Yeah, Aerosmith, dude looks like a lady, is actually about Vince Neil. Yeah, you know, I think the whole dude looks like a lady thing came from uh, Aerosmith uh, being inspired by Molly Crew and not making fun of them directly. I think that uh, Steven Tyler was hanging around with Molly Crew and hearing them say, you know, dude, dude, dude. That's how they kind of talk. And uh, also, he and Vince Neil went out one night to this bar and the waiters were dressed like women. And so they were commenting about how, you know, dude, looks like a lady. Kind of tell where that whole thing kind of came out. But uh, yeah, if you want to see me beat up on Motley Crue, uh, just check out my video, same old farewell situation after they ripped up the cessation of touring agreement. I declared them the most full of shit band in the world. You can check out that video. You know, I bust on Motley Crue a lot, but uh, I got to give the band credit where credit is due, all right? I mean, Motley Crue were there at the beginning of the uh, hair band, whatever you want to call it, phase that came around in the early part of the 80s, you know, uh, just look at them. In 82, they had the look that would, uh, you know, be played out throughout the rest of the decade, you know. And of course, Quiet Riot were the first, technically the first metal band to have a number one album in 1983. But Motley Crue had their first, you know, top 20 album uh, that same year with Shout at the Devil. And uh, things just got better and better for them as the years went on. And, uh, you know, you got to give credit to Motley Crue. They were part of the innovators of the scene. I talked about the innovators, the imitators, and the imposters. And this is all a record label thing, you know. They see a band like uh, Motley Crue and Quiet Riot go to number one or top 20 and they're like wow get me 10 more of these guys you know and so that's when we get the next crop eventually of bands that are just more on the image and less on the substance. Here's another comment from Jimmy Mack he says agree with your assessment of the rest of the 90s the decade brought in constipated singers and the start of cookie monster vocalists when you think about it Van Halen helped start hair metal the bands slowed it down and added ballads. All those L.A. bands looked up to Van Halen. Yeah, Jimmy, thanks for that comment. I love the Cookie Monster vocalists and the constipated singers. I mean, look, in the 80s, it was singing high. As high as you can sing, that's what was needed. By the 90s, it was a total opposite. Everybody was singing real low like this and really aggressive and depressive. And that's what you needed to sell albums. 
And uh, thanks for mentioning Van Halen too. You know, I was just talking about Motley Crue and how they were at the forefront of the hair band scene in the early 80s. But Van Halen, they were on the scene in the uh, mid to late 70s. They were the prototype for this entire movement. I mean, when they came out, on the Sunset Strip or in Pasadena, they were blowing people's minds. You know, you had this lead singer with so much charisma, blonde hair with the bandana jumping around, Eddie Van Halen. I mean, guitar players were shitting their pants because they were like, felt like they were going to be irrelevant in a few more years and they needed to really get some lessons and and really you know try to adapt to what was about to come because you look through the whole 80s hair metal scene and a lot of those guitar players were you know picking on the fretboards and trying to imitate Eddie Van Halen and the whole look of Van Halen was definitely something that a lot of these bands, Motley Crue, uh, you know, Poison and Rat, they all looked up to Van Halen and modeled a lot of what they did after them. So you got to give Van Halen credit for uh, really, you know, inspiring uh, this whole scene. All right, how about I pour some more trivia on you? See if you can get this one. Which guitarist auditioned for Poison but would have turned them down had he been offered the job? Was it A, Slash of Guns N' Roses, B, Warren D. Martini of Rat, or C, George Lynch of Dokken? The answer is A, Slash of Guns N' Roses. That's right, according to Slash from a 2014 interview, here's what he had to say about his audition for Poison. He said, I played the shit out of the songs, but I wasn't too keen on the dress code. So that was that. Poison was a full on 80s glam kind of thing. And I was down to earth as is sort of how I am now. I left there that day and CC was walking in for his audition and I knew that was the guy because he was dressed to the nines and sequins and makeup and the hair was up and that was what the image was about. Yeah, Slash also mentioned that he showed up at the uh, audition with moccasins on his feet, which uh, really wasn't too poison after all, was it? Uh, here's another comment. Julie C. She says, I agree that the hair metal scene ran its course, and by the time Firehouse came along, it was over. Too many ballads, too much I'm singing to 15-year-olds bullshit. Danger, Danger, Trickster, Nelson, all these bands mark the end. The timing was perfect for Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, other great heavier bands to hit the scene. What bothers me most is that we called those 80s to 90s bands metal, when the real metal back then was Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, although they had some corny songs, Iron Maiden, etc. And thank you for taking a serious look at this time period. I watch a lot of YouTube and I often do not come across any good hair metal analysis. And Julie, thanks so much for the comment. I really love the hair metal analysis. Uh, that's you know something you don't hear too often and that's kind of what we're doing now, isn't it? And I totally agree the word metal is misplaced. You know, these bands are not metal bands. Even calling them hair metal is uh, doing these pretty boys too much justice. You know, I think the real heavy metal bands of that day uh, were Judas Priest and Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and Metallica. Uh, you know, what do you guys think? You know, we're going to dig into this a little bit more here with the next comment. Uh, Quiet Riot is legit metal, man. So is Warrant. Dude, Twisted Sister isn't metal? Have you heard their albums or just the singles? That's right. You know, I don't consider Quiet Riot and Warrant and Twisted Sister to be heavy metal. I mean, they are hard rock bands. I mean, Twisted Sister even has an album called You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. I mean, what metal band puts out an album with that title? To me, what separates metal from these other genres is the subject matter. It's the themes. I mean, heavy metal is known for some pretty heavy themes like war. Go back to Black Sabbath, the Paranoid album, you know, these are the godfathers of metal on the song War Pigs, you know, singing about how the rich elite, you know, use our children like pawns in chess, sending them out to war. I mean, this is some heavy, dark stuff here. And Metallica picks up on this with Master of Puppets. I mean, look at that album cover. Uh, the song is also about drug addiction, the title track to Master of Puppets, you know, chop your breakfast on a mirror, one of the great lyrics from that tune. And then, of course, you know, there's lots of metal bands that sing about the occult and Satanism. You know, Iron Maiden's got the, you know, Eddie and all the imagery that comes from that. Slayer, you know, they got Rain in Blood, that album, and South of Heaven, but they don't, they're not really into this stuff. This is just for shock value. Now, there are bands that are perhaps more serious about this kind of thing, but uh, these are like the Norwegian death 
death metal bands that uh, you know would think nothing of burning a church down on Sunday at uh, 10 a.m. You know, I'm reminded of this time back in college when I converted one of my hair metal friends to heavy metal, and he was really into like Cinderella and Kicks and that kind of stuff. And I was listening to the new Metallica, which had just come out, which was Injustice for All. This was 1989. And he was like, I, I can't believe that you listen to that shit. And I'm like, well, what's so wrong with it? And he's like, well, listen to those lyrics, you know? He was talking about the song Blackened, where it says, you know, see our mother put to death, see our mother die. And he was like, you know, that's some sick shit, man. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand what it's about. And then I showed him how this is a song about the destruction of Earth, uh, you know, through nuclear war or whatever. And then, you know, the whole album, look at the album cover. It's about justice. It's about corruption. This is the kind of shit that was going on then, and it's still going on now. You know, this is like heavy themes, but it's very timely and very serious. This stuff affects all of us. And I was explaining to him what this was about. Yeah, I mean, once he realized this and made the connection, then he was like, oh, okay, now I get it. And then, then he became a fan and has been a fan ever since. And of course, these lyrics, a far cry from other lyrics going on in 1988, like these from Lita Ford. Remember these? Yeah, I went to a party last Saturday night. I didn't get laid. I got in a fight. Uh-huh. It ain't no big thing. All right, here's another comment from Anthony. He says, I think your problem is you have a problem with ballads. What? It's not cool to say I love you to a woman? If that's the case, you and I wouldn't be in this world, so that's laughable. So then uh, Anthony and I went back and forth for a little bit, and uh, he was talking about Firehouse and uh, what's wrong with them. And I said, well, you know, send me some songs, and I'll see what I think about them. And so uh, he went on to suggest these. Uh, Don't walk away, hold a dream and also love of a lifetime and when I look into your eyes. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for the comment and for the recommendations. I did check them all out as promised. And uh, if you're watching, you know, I, I really, look, Firehouse, they can play, they can perform. This, that's not what this is about. To me, it's just nothing original. I didn't hear anything I haven't heard before. Uh, Don't Walk Away sounds like a poor man's white snake. Uh, Love of a Lifetime, I remember hearing that back in the day. And uh, it's a formulaic ballad that was just par for the course. And of course, the other song, When I Look Into Your Eyes, sounds like Love of a Lifetime, just with a different chorus. And so the songs really didn't do much for me, but you know, thanks for recommending them. And you know, getting into the whole ballads thing, I think that you know, if Van Halen set the stage and were the prototype for you know, the hair metal bands that came in the 80s, I think that the whole thing with the ballads was set up by a band like Journey. They were the prototype for the big power ballads. I mean, here you had this big rock band, arena rock band, all of a sudden, these huge power ballads like open arms, let's say. Now I know it's not hair metal, but I think it was the spark that ignited songs like Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue. Again, we're talking about Motley Crue. They set the trends of the 80s with their look, you know, early on. And then with the big power ballad, Home Sweet Home has got to be the first hair band power ballad that, you know, set the table for the rest of the 80s. Well, when the 90s came in with the whole grunge movement and the Seattle sound, they didn't have the power ballads, but they did go unplugged. Remember this? MTV Unplugged uh, featured a lot of these bands, Nirvana, uh, also Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains and the Stone Temple Pilots, all of these bands getting a bit more sensitive and stripped down. You know, where did this all come from? You know, and actually I think this whole unplugged movement really got its roots with Bon Jovi back in 1987 with Wanted Dead or Alive. I mean, this was an epic, you know, acoustic driven song that eventually wound up inspiring, I think, uh, Tesla with the unplugged signs from their five man acoustical gym. I remember working in radio when that came out and it was explosive. I mean, we were always playing that. People wanted to hear that. And I think that is what kicked off the unplugged era. Let me know what you think about how bands got unplugged and uh, what your favorites were from that era. All right, and here's our final comment from Thomas. He says, just watch this. Great retrospective on this topic. I'm a music history buff and was in high school when all this was happening. Thanks for letting me relive some of my favorite musical memories. 
Yeah, Thomas, uh, thanks so much for the comment. Uh, this does bring back a lot of memories for me too. Uh, like yourself, I was a teenager growing up in the 80s, went to college towards the end. In the 90s, I was in my 20s. So when all this hair metal stuff and grunge was out, uh, this was targeted right at my age group. You know, those who were in their teens and their early 20s, we were the ones buying these albums, going to see these bands in concert for the most part. And uh, so a lot of memories here. And uh, it gets you wondering, you know, what is it that killed off these bands? You know, what caused all this change? And we often try to pin it on one thing. But I think it was multiple things, you know. Uh, these hair bands going away and these grunge bands going away. I think one of the major factors are the record labels. You know, like I said, I talked earlier about the innovators and the imitators and the imposters. And this whole phenomenon is created by the record labels who, you know, they see one good thing and they want ten. And so that winds up causing a lot of garbage to seep in. And before you know it, it becomes a parody. And then it's done. It's like a one big joke. Uh, also, the bands themselves, you know, we had a lot of bands that were just brought up because of their image. And they became a parody of themselves. And I think that they were going to die off anyway. And so that's another reason why we saw these bands fade out. And something else to consider is how the generation of fans changes. You know, your tastes change. You know, you go from a teenager to being in your 20s, and then you're getting your first job. You're starting a family. You're no longer maybe the ones buying all these albums and going to see all these bands. Uh, it's time for another generation to, to come up and fill that void. And so your tastes change, and things change. Things don't stay the same forever. And so that's another factor that you have to consider here too. Also, you know, of course, there were these sounds coming out of Seattle that were undeniable. People were just connecting with this new sound. It was very, very real. You know, uh, bands basically walking out on stage with what they probably wore to fucking sleep. You know what I mean? The corduroy or the jean jackets and whatever. And you know, if the Sunset Strip fueled the 80s, then the Seattle sounds fueled the 90s. And that's just the way it was. And then, of course, there was the emergence of the alternative you know, sounds, which uh, they were alternative in the 80s, but by the 90s, they became mainstream. You know, bands like Jane's Addiction and uh, Nine Inch Nails and Smashing Pumpkins. These were bands that were going on in the 80s, but by the 90s, they were right out there in the open. So a lot more variety and just different flavors. And these are the types of things, what I just mentioned, these are the different... Uh, forces at play that help to, you know, end one era and bring in another one. You know, let me know what you think about it. Why did we see the hair bands and the grunge bands come and go? Would love to hear what you have to say about that. Now, before I wrap up this video, I just want to share one last thing. In my last video, Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, I talked about when I showed up at college, I came with CDs while most everybody else still was carrying crates of vinyl. And uh, my old college roommate recently sent me a photo that I had forgotten about, which was our wall in one of our dorm rooms. We used to wallpaper it with the CDs that we bought. Remember back in the day, CDs would come in these long boxes? Well, I wouldn't put it to waste. I'd slap it up on the wall and it became the wallpaper. And so here's a photo of that. I can tell this is 1989 because of the Tom Petty Full Moon Fever, which had recently come out, and uh, Sonic Temple by The Cult. You'll see that there, too. Of course, there's Guns N' Roses. That was a huge band when I was in college. Huge, huge. Uh, looking at some of the other metal-related, there's Metallica, The Garage Days, up in the corner. Uh, there also was Ozzy Osbourne, No Rest for the Wicked. Of course, there's Injustice for All that I was just talking about. Over on the other side, you'll see Slayer, South of Heaven, which is my favorite Slayer album that had just come out not too long before that. Uh, Kill Em All by Metallica there. So, uh, yeah, this was The Wall. All right, everybody, thanks so much for checking out this video, and I hope it brought back some memories for you. I know it did for me. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up, and also hit that subscribe button, and leave a comment that will uh, let YouTube know that you enjoy this video, and they'll get it in front of more fans that may also enjoy it, too. Be sure to check out the companion playlist to this video, loaded with videos, documentaries, all kinds of stuff uh, related to how glam went glum. All right. So thanks for watching and I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Take care.